I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And you know, in our society today, there are a lot of people who are seeking fame, especially young people. And I'm not saying that it is something bad. I can't say it's something bad, right? I'm someone who spends my hour after hour on television, on radio for years and years and years. So I, I kind of get it. I kind of understand it. And in the world we live in today with social media and, and TikTok and Facebook and Instagram, I mean, there are people that are getting very famous um, from coast to coast and around the world. And at a very young age, it is happening. Now, translate that to the world that we talk about every night here on Closing Arguments, the world of true crime, where um, when you talk about fame, unfortunately, it's usually the killers who get most famous. I mean, take, take for instance, the most famous serial killer of all time, Ted Bundy, right? This guy, unfortunately, is iconic. You say his name, people know who he is, they know what he's done, and he is famous. He's really infamous, right? More so than famous, but fame came to him because of what he did, which was killing people, taking the lives of people. But for, for Ted Bundy, it took some time to gain that fame because as a serial killer, he'd kill someone, he'd kill someone else, and he was getting away with it. Uh, it wasn't until he got caught that then he began to get famous. Again, going back to this world of true crime, the, the killers who get famous instantly are really the mass killers, the mass shooters, and we see tons of them in schools, like in the Parkland school shooting. This guy got very famous very quickly, and, and the reason is because when something happens like that, when you have a, a, a young person who acts out and takes the lives of classmates, and, and everyone want, has one question, of why? Why would they do it? And then members of the media, like me and others, dig and dig into the lives of these killers, and then they become famous or infamous because we find out every fact trying to answer that question, why? But I want you to think about this. What if the answer to that question as to why they did it is for the fame itself? That's the case with the Oxford school shooter who was seeking fame. The Oxford school shooter in Michigan is enjoying all of this notoriety. And he got it all because of, of what he did inside that school that day. And I'm saying he did it because they're uh, alleging, um, you know, legal insanity. They're not saying he didn't do it. They're saying he was mentally ill at the time that he did do it, that he was legally insane. But the, the answer to that question, why, what motivated him was the fame itself. And as a result of that, in the trial of his parents, who've also been accused in the deaths of those, uh, those people inside the school, they've been implicated, they have their own case. In that case, prosecutors, because they know that the Oxford school shooter is loving the attention, loving the notoriety, loving the fame, they're refusing, absolutely refusing to use his name inside the courtroom in the trial of the Oxford School shooter's parents. Now, for those of you who don't know their story, take a listen. <laughs> The uh, deputies uh, took a suspect into custody within five minutes of the original 911 call. They recovered a handgun from the suspect. The suspect fired multiple shots. There's multiple victims. I was basically in the fetal position shaking because I was scared. It was very scary, but like I was trying, like we were trying not to panic. It's just crazy because like people always say like it's never going to happen to them. And the fact that it happened to two people that I really care about, like it's just really hard. 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly accused of shooting and killing four classmates and injuring seven others at Oxford High School. While the shooter was the one who entered the high school and pulled the trigger, 
There are other individuals who contributed to this, to the events on November 30th, and it's my intention to hold them accountable as well. Based on the information and evidence I have received, today I am announcing charges against the shooter's parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly. We have, in fact, taken under custody without incident James and Jennifer Crumbly, uh, the fugitives involved in the Oxford uh, incident. In Ethan's journal, which was provided in discovery, he explicitly states, and I quote, that he has to find where his dad hid the firearm. The evidence will show that Ethan Crumbly was gravely troubled. He was fascinated with firearms. He was violent. He displayed terrifying tendencies and behaviors. And he literally sketched out what he had planned to do in his journal and his drawings. With the negligence on the part of these defendants and their failure to perform the duties of their parents, far perceived November the 30th. Okay, let's get back now to this whole issue of their son, right? His name, his fame. Take a listen to what the prosecutor said in court about all of that. We're not going to give him the fame that he sought, and we're certainly not going to contribute to any um, potential shooter in the future. And I get it. And I get it. And, and, and here's... The real headline to all of this is that the judge agrees. The judge agrees. The name of the Oxford School shooter will not be permitted in the trial of his parents. Did you hear me? This is extremely unusual, but I understand it. The judge will not permit the name of the Oxford School shooter to be used in the trial of his parents. Let's get back to the why of it, because there is a backstory to all this. I'm gonna show you a clip from a hearing for the Oxford School shooter himself, the student, their son. Take a listen. And his behaviors since his incarceration have not changed. They've continued to demonstrate that he hasn't altered his way of thinking. His request on December 17th, you'll see in the exhibits uh, from the jail, his request that he, re how do I get my fan mail, my hate mail, and, and my commissary. He knows that he's going to have people who admire him and people who hate him alike, and he wants that notoriety. He also takes time to mention to some of his fans out there, my next court date is February 22nd. Maybe you can watch it on TV. This is what he wants. He wants to be noticed. He wants us to relish in his behaviors. And if he is given the opportunity to converse one-on-one -on -one with little to no supervision because we won't have these in writing when he's at Children's Village, when he's talking to another juvenile in the corner of the gym, when he's talking with them at the lunch table. And that should scare all of us, and I know it scares me. So he's going to have his own trial. Tonight we're talking about the trial of his parents, where because of what you just heard, his name will not be permitted to be used in that trial. Let's talk about this. Let's bring in a think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy in Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, and in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series, Trapped with Ms. Arias. Please check it out. Kirk Nurmi is with us. Great to see everyone. Um, Eklund Mercy, yeah. you've got a trial of a mother and father who've been implicated for the shootings that were done by their son, yet their son's name cannot be used in their trial. You can refer to him as the shooter if you want. That I can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, especially when the reason why they have the charges is because of the son. We need the son's name. The jury should be privy to all the information so his attor um, their attorneys can provide a competent and zealous defense. Unfortunately, although, yes, we can't, um, it's kind of ironic that they're trying to really control the outcome. However, they're also, at, they're also basically trying to ask the parents to control the outcome of their son. 
parents don't know. I, I, unfortunately, we have, a, as a defense attorney, I have seen parents who have no idea what their children are up to, who have no idea what type of psychological issues that they're going through, and would not even be able to understand or um, really just anticipate a murder or a shooting or things like that. So to put all that burden on parents to just know what your children is thinking, what they're capable of at all times, I think it's unfair. I really do, and I don't. And I and I think that if they're going to proceed with you know charges, that the parents be able to be able to provide a competent and zealous defense, and not being able to mention the name is a problem. Nima Romani, the obvious place for these parents to point the finger is at their own son. Can't say his name though. Finny, brace yourself. I agree with Eklund. I understand the public policy reasons the district attorney, is state attorney, is not naming Ethan Crumbly. You know, they don't want to give him notoriety. And frankly, they want the case to be about the parents, right? They don't want them pointing the finger at someone else, someone more culpable, someone who actually pulled the trigger. But this is fundamental to their defense. They're obviously going to blame one another. That's why they got a separate counsel appointed. That should have happened weeks ago, if not months ago. But they should absolutely be able to blame their son. This is a case that will. Well, they could blame litigated. him. They could just call him son. They could call him shooter. They can call him killer. But but there's no legal basis not to name the most obvious person who killed these individuals. I, but don't get me wrong. The parents are responsible. They should be prosecuted. But Vinny, you and I know that this case is going to go up on appeal. The Second Amendment folks, the gun lobby, they're going to litigate this the whole way. This may end up before the Supreme Court. This is a case of novel well, we're going to make law here. And to create another appellate issue unnecessarily, I don't agree with what the trial judge did here. Eklund, you're right. Whoa, Kirk Nurmi. Well, how can I follow Nima agreeing with Eklund? But yeah, ultimately, they're both right, because the, the Sixth Amendment right is an individual right. It's owned by each and every one of its individuals. It's not affected by any relative of yours and what they may or may not be seeking at trial. So if it infringes upon the Sixth Amendment right, there you, you are going to have an appellate issue. I can envision a scenario when you're talking about selecting a jury and you have to say their son and you don't mention the name. What about if these parents want to testify at trial and the theory is that they're disconnected from their son? So instead of loving refer to him by his name, they're forced to say our son or something generic or the shooter or what have you. So there is no legal reasoning behind this. I certainly understand what you laid out and some of the reasons why we want to prevent people from seeking fame and committing these type of crimes. But now that we're here, the Sixth Amendment attaches to both these parents and they should be able to actualize their rights fully. And any restrictions on that to me seem ripe, as Nima said, for appellate issues should there be a conviction in this case. All right, folks, uh, we are continuing to uh, track this story, um, this trial as it, as it moves forward. It's again, as everyone here on the think tank is, is talking about tonight, there are a lot of issues here. It's a novel case. We've never seen anything like it before. And uh, I've never seen a ruling like this ever before either. We're still waiting to get the written uh, order from the judge on this issue. So uh, we've got that. What we're going to do, think tank with us the whole hour. When we come back.